Hi, I'm Ken Olivier. I'm one of the lung doctors or pulmonologists at the National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute. And it's my pleasure to speak to you today about managing lung issues. And we'll talk about two conditions uh, managed, that are both seen in the common variable immune deficiency or CVID, which is one of the most common of the immune deficiencies uh, and it's characterized by antibody uh, deficiencies. Um, so I'll first talk about what these disorders are, what is bronchiectasis, what is granulomatous interstitial lung disease, uh, or GLILD, uh, and then some aspects of lung diagnosis, uh, the use of CT scans, uh, pulmonary function testing, uh, collection uh, or elimination of sputum or phlegm, uh, and the use of the diagnostic procedures, bronchoscopy and lung biopsy, and then finally, some aspects of treatment of both of the, these disorders. So first of all, bronchiectasis uh, is a long word uh, that refers to ballooning or enlargement of the bronchial tubes. Um, and if you'll note uh, on the screen, um, this cartoon representation of normal airways here, which generally taper like the branches of trees as they go out toward the periphery, and if you contrast that to these airways here, which are dilated uh, and enlarged in these sort of sacs or out pouches coming off the airways, uh, and the uh, artist has represented collection of mucus or sputum uh, in these areas, and these airways don't drain normally. It's difficult to clear things out of here, uh, and the airways themselves become inflamed, uh, and this predisposes or is associated with um, infection, which may be chronic uh, or acute or recurring uh, in nature. Typically, patients present with a chronic wet cough, uh, and frequently there are flares, uh, what we call exacerbations. And these may be represented by an increase in cough uh, or an increase in amount of sputum that is produced or a change in the color of the sputum um, that may signify uh, a bacterial or other type of infection. Uh, these frequently uh, require antibiotics uh, for treatment, uh, and sometimes the antibiotics may need to be continued over a long term for certain types of chronic infections. Uh, as the disease progresses, patients might experience uh, shortness of breath associated with this as well. Uh, doctors love long names, uh, and then they love to abbreviate them um, with terms like GLILD or G-L-I-L-D. This stands for granulomatous lymphocytic interstitial lung disease. And this is a different type of lung disease that doesn't necessarily involve the airways. It involves the interstitium or sort of the, the uh, business aspects of the lung, the air sacs and the areas around them. Uh, and it typically is characterized on a CT scan shown in this image here as these small nodules uh, or masses in the lungs, uh, which are basically small inflammatory tumors called granulomas. And it's too much inflammation characterizes this disease, generally an, an increase in the numbers of white blood cells called lymphocytes uh, and these scattered granulomas or inflammatory masses throughout the lungs. Uh, it may also be associated with an enlarged spleen uh, and enlarged lymph nodes as well. Frequently, patients don't have symptoms when this initially starts, um, and generally screening uh, of uh, patients with CVID uh, with periodic CT scans uh, are recommended to be able to detect this. Uh, if patients do present with symptoms, it may be things like cough uh, or, again, shortness of breath. Both of these conditions are best detected on a computed tomography or CT scan of the chest. And I'd like to talk a little bit about how this is done because I think that it's important um, that you are familiar with it so that you can go over these images uh, with your physician um, or your child's physician and be aware of what you're looking at. So typically um, the patient is um, asked to lie down on a sliding uh, table uh, that's represented here. Um, and then they're moved through what's called a gantry, uh, which some people refer to as a donut, uh, where the uh, imaging equipment is um, 
uh, housed. Uh, and this takes cross-sectional images um, through the chest and it's represented by this red circle here. So when you look at the image that's seen, if you think of the screen as acting as a slicer, it correlates uh, with the cross sections taken as um, the patient is moved incrementally through the scanner. Um, and when you look at the image, uh, if you think of it in terms of this orientation, except looking from the other side of the gantry. So it's as if the screen is a slicer, uh, your feet are over by where you are looking at it, uh, you're lying flat on a table uh, like this, and your head's on the other side of that screen. So the image is oriented as if you're looking up from your feet. Uh, and so uh, this is the uh, right side of the body here. Uh, this is the left side of the body here. Uh, in the back of the image of the patient will be here and the front of the chest is up at the top. Uh, and that's the general orientation of the images that you're looking at that are taken by this machine uh, in cross section. It can also be reformatted in different orientations, but this is the most common way of looking at it. And on this image, uh, this is the heart in the middle of the scan. Uh, and this is the lung, which shows up, the air shows up as dark or black. And this white um, area in the middle is representing a, a tumor in this particular patient. In terms of how CT images look for these two conditions, uh, for bronchiectasis, I've put this cartoon image back again, showing the dilated airways. And if you look at the CT image, uh, this is now taking not in cross section, but in sort of long section um, through the body um, with this being the windpipe up here, the heart is represented here. Uh, this is the top of the patient and the bottom of the patient here. Uh, and this is the lung, uh, the left lung of the patient. Uh, and the airways normally are difficult to see. If you look here, these white lines are blood vessels and the airways um, are usually about the same diameter as the blood vessel, uh, but here they're very dilated. The interior is black uh, shown by air here, and you might be able to see the outline of the airway walls. And these airways here and here are very abnormal. Uh, those are areas of bronchiectasis. Uh, for GLILD or granulomatous interstitial lung disease, um, the appearance is quite different. Again, this is in what's called the axial or the cross-sectional um, orientation. This is the heart in the middle. This is the front of the chest. This is the back of the chest. And the arrow here is pointing to one of these um, enlarged nodules or masses. Uh, and shown in this cartoon, uh, these are inflammatory uh, tumors or growths in the lung. Uh, again, they have lymphocytes around the outside and then other inflammatory cells in the middle. And these will generally go away uh, or frequently go away in response to uh, anti-inflammatory or immune suppressive type medications, uh, which we'll talk about on a subsequent slide. To measure the significance or the functional um, impact of these lung diseases, uh, frequently pulmonary function testing is used. Uh, and this may consist of three different uh, tests that are done in the pulmonary function lab. The most common is spirometry, uh, where the patient has a nose clip on and breathes in and out through a mouthpiece. And you're generally asked after breathing normally to take in as deep a breath as you can and then blow it out as hard and as fast as, and as long as you can. This measures obstruction to airflow and is frequently used in conditions like asthma or COPD uh, or in bronchiectasis. And it's important that you give a very good effort when you're forcing that air out and that you breathe it out as long as possible uh, to get an accurate measurement. Other tests that are done are called lung volumes, uh, which some people call the body box test. This is generally a clear glass booth that the patient sits in, and then you're asked to breathe in and out through a mouthpiece. This person is shown holding their cheeks in, uh, and you're generally asked to pant against a closed um, uh, mouthpiece here. This is based on the principle of if you have a known pressure and volume in this box, and you measure pressure at the mouth, you can derive the volume in the lung. And this allows us to look at things like the total amount of air in the lung and the amount of air left in the lung after you maximally exhale. These measurements are particularly helpful in GLILD, 
uh, in measuring the impact of it, along with a test called diffusion capacity, which measures how well oxygen gets from the uh, lungs into the bloodstream. Uh, and this is done by, again, a mouthpiece. You're asked to uh, take in a deep breath, hold it for 12 seconds, and then slowly exhale. Uh, and it measures the ability of those gases to move across that uh, border between the air sacs and the small vessels around them. And then the fourth test is a functional test generally done along a prescribed uh, 30 meter uh, course, frequently out in a hallway uh, where you're asked at the start uh, to walk as fast as you can over a six minute period. Uh, and the distance that is covered is measured. That ends up being re very reproducible test to test. And you also are usually asked to wear a device called an oximeter, which measures your heart rate and your oxygen saturation. Uh, and as these diseases progress, um, exercise may be impacted or the ability to maintain normal oxygen levels may be impacted as well. And this test allows us to detect that. Uh, for bronchiectasis in particular, uh, you may be asked to provide a sputum specimen, uh, which you may cough up. Uh, or you may be um, instructed to perform what's called airway clearance at home to get these secretions out of the lungs that nor don't clear normally. Uh, and this is frequently done by having you inhale a concentrated salt water, what's called hypertonic saline, through either a mouthpiece or a mask as shown here, uh, which helps to loosen those secretions up that you can then cough into a container to send to the lab. And we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, on the next slide. There are also devices that can be used. Uh, these two devices here have what are called a variable resistor, uh, which makes it a little more difficult to blow through, kind of like blowing through a straw. That helps to stent the airways open and keep them from collapsing uh, when you're trying to cough. Um, and in these devices, you can attach a nebulizer uh, that you can inhale the hypertonic saline through. And then when you exhale, it sets up uh, vibrations in the airway, so a combination of the increased moisture in these vibrations help to clear the airways out. These are simple handheld devices. There are also other devices that are a bit more complex, such as a, a percussive or a shaker vest, uh, which you can wear that's connected to a compressor that helps to shake or jar loose these secretions. And other devices that you may inhale solutions under pressure or in this device generate sound waves uh, that helps to loosen these secretions as well. Many of our patients use um, one or more of these devices along with hypertonic saline as part of their regular treatment for bronchiectasis. The sputum tests that you, um, or sputum specimens that you provide are generally sent to a microbiology lab. They're generally streaked out on Petri dishes like this under different conditions to grow different types of organisms. And they may include in bacteria uh, with names such as Pseudomonas or Staph, uh, these generally grow out within one to two days, uh, or uh, it may uh, include uh, mold such as uh, aspergillus, the common household mold, uh, which tends to grow out over three to five days, uh, or these organisms called non-tuberculous mycobacteria, uh, which are similar to tuberculosis, but are not transmitted person to person in general, and generally are acquired from the environment uh, with names like mycobacterium abscessus or mycobacterium avium complex, the more common of these. These may grow out within seven days, what are called rapid growers, uh, but not rapid compared to these organisms. Um, and the more common one, Mycobacterium avium complex, generally takes two to three weeks to grow out. And these plates are generally held up to six weeks to be able to recover the very slower, slowly growing organisms. In patients that can't produce sputum uh, or when more certainty is needed for diagnosing infection and other conditions in the lung, a procedure called bronchoscopy may be done. This is generally done either under anesthesia in an operating or procedure room, or we commonly do this under what's called conscious sedation, where patients are giving sedatives um, that help to make them sleepy, uh, but still able to breathe on their, alone, on their own. Uh, this consists of a flexible tube that's placed through either the mouth or the nose, 
uh, and directed down into the lung that has a video camera on it uh, that the operator can see on a screen. And it allows us to obtain directed samples uh, from areas of involvement of the lung. Most commonly, this involves uh, what's called lavage, which is putting sterile salt water down through the scope and suctioning it back into a container uh, that can then be sent to the lab. Sometimes biopsies can be done where a small wire is passed down through the scope that has a pincher on the end of it um, that can be used to obtain small pieces of the lung. When larger uh, pieces of the lung are needed for diagnosis, and this may be the case with GLILD, uh, a procedure called lung biopsy may be done. Frequently, this is also done through a scope uh, but generally under general anesthesia in the operating room uh, where three small incisions are made, a camera is inserted through one of them and the instruments to obtain the biopsies are done through the other. Uh, patients may have a chest tube in place for a while after this is done, uh, but frequently recovery time from this procedure is fairly short. In terms of treatment uh, for bronchiectasis first, um, as I mentioned, uh, one of the modalities that we frequently discuss with our patients is airway clearance. Uh, and this has three different components to it. Uh, we place a high degree of importance on regular aerobic exercise uh, and encourage our patients to do at least 20 to 30 minutes of programmed exercise on most days of the week. It doesn't really matter what you do to do this. And if you meet uh, the heart rate uh, goals for cardiovascular fitness, you'll generally meet what's uh, helpful for your lungs as well. Um, and the idea behind this is that the increased depth and frequency of breathing uh, and the sort of movement involved in exercise helps to loosen these secretions and clear them out. As we discussed, uh, many of our patients also inhale uh, salt water or saline and use these shaking or vibrating devices. Uh, antibiotics uh, are frequently used either in short periods for treatment of exacerbations or flare-ups uh, of the infection. Uh, and these may either be antibiotics taken by mouth, sometimes they're inhaled antibiotics uh, or antibiotics given by vein. And then finally, we encourage our patients to keep up with uh, recommended vaccinations, an annual flu shot, um, having uh, the streptococcal or pneumonia vaccines uh, in uh, appropriate patients. Uh, and in this day and age, uh, having the COVID vaccine uh, can help prevent uh, lung, further lung problems. The treatment of GLILD uh, is a bit more complex. Um, this occurs in the setting of CVID, and if patients aren't already on um, supplementation with immune globulin or IVIG or subcutaneous or subQIG, um, generally it's recommended that they go on to that. Though frequently um, this treatment by itself is not adequate um, to um, uh, treat the, the, the lung disease associated with this. There's a lot of variability in treatment approaches, but a common approach uh, is a combination treatment that may combine um, a drug that's active against what are called B cells, certain type of lymphocytes, uh, and the drugs are designed to block those cells. The drug commonly used to do this is rituximab, uh, which is an antibody directed uh, against these types of cells. This is generally combined with drugs that are active against what are called T cells or a different type of lymphocyte and may include drugs such as azathioprine or mycophenolate. Um, and then frequently steroids are used maybe as an initial treatment. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, a lot of times these changes that are seen on the CT scan representing these granulomas or increases in lymphocytes, these will clear up fairly rapidly with steroids but generally steroids alone may not be sufficient to keep this away. And that's when these other drugs are, are generally used. Uh, to assess whether these are working or not, um, we, patients are generally monitored by obtaining um, CT scans and pulmonary function tests at set intervals uh, to make sure that it responds appropriately uh, and that it remains uh, in remission. So this concludes my uh, talk uh, for today, and I'm happy at this point to entertain any uh, questions that you may have. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. At this time, please join me in thanking Dr. 
Kenneth Oliver from the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute at NIH for that wonderful presentation and saying welcome to the Q&A portion of this session. I'm Kathy Antla. I'll be the moderator for this session. And before we begin, a quick disclaimer that re please remember that each individual's treatment and condition is unique. The information presented during this session is not medical advice, nor is it intended to be a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Please always seek the advice of a physician or other qualified healthcare provider with questions concerning a medical diagnosis. We have received a lot of great questions, and here's the first one, Dr. Olivier. Can you please explain bronchiolitis obliterans, organizing pneumonia, and its relation to PI? Sure, that's a, a great question. Um, bronchiolitis obliterans, organizing pneumonia, uh, which some people call BOOP, uh, is actually now called cryptogenic organizing pneumonia. And cryptogenic means that we usually don't know what the cause of it is. So this is seen in certain uh, inflammatory conditions. It can be seen in um, rheumatoid conditions like rheumatoid arthritis or lupus, um, and it's a nonspecific inflammation in the lung um, where there's filling of the air sacs with inflammatory cells that extend out into the smaller airways. Um, it generally is very steroid responsive, um, and it can have variable relationships to primary immunodeficiencies, but it can also be seen in other conditions as well. Have you seen any exasperation of bronchiectasis while using high pressure CPAP for sleep apnea with or without humidification? And can humidification be dangerous for people with PI and lung issues? Yeah, another great question. You would think if the airways were uh, dilated, as I showed in the cartoon and CT uh, examples there, that uh, having positive pressure in the airway uh, might make that worse. Uh, but we actually don't see that. And uh, we uh, not only have patients who use CPAP, but occasionally patients with bronchiectasis will uh, be on mechanical ventilation where there's positive pressure going into the lung. And it doesn't tend to make the airways more dilated. It can uh, sometimes result in more uh, impaction of secretions in the uh, distal or smaller airways. Um, however, um, the CPAP can also be beneficial in stenting those airways open to allow better drainage. Uh, the humidification is not dangerous to people with PI and lung diseases. Uh, in fact, the humidification can be very helpful uh, in keeping the airways from drying out during CPAP uh, treatment. Uh, and we generally recommend that as sort of standard use along with uh, CPAP if, if it's available. Uh, the one thing that is key is that you um, use either sterile water or, or water that's been boiled uh, and that you clean those humidifier devices uh, as recommended um, so that they don't get contaminated um, with bacteria or other organisms. Are the small nodules are small nodules often characterized as semi-solid nodules? Yeah, sometimes they're called semi-solid nodules. Um, frequently, the radiologists will call them ground glass opacities, and I think that's uh, maybe a, a better term, uh, and it refers to the ability to see other structures uh, through those uh, nodules on the CT scan uh, as opposed to uh, consolidated nodules, which appear as sort of bright white, uh, and they block out the view of the structures that are behind them. Are granulomas in the lungs considered as GLILD? Oh, okay. I, I think uh, what I'm reading on the question is granulomas in the lungs with low CD8, CD28, and elevated CD28, CD57, uh, are those consistent with um, GLILD or granulomatous interstitial 
uh, lung disease. Mm -hmm. um, I have to say that, you know, these specific uh, memory and senescence markers uh, that are on CD8 uh, cells, um, one kind of exceed my immunology knowledge. <laughs> I'm a pulmonologist. Um, but I think it's important that those uh, lymphocyte phenotype markers are put in the context of the clinical disease that it's seen along with. So GLILD can be seen in common variable immune deficiency. And as many of you know, uh, that can be a, a category of conditions that as we get better with genetics and diagnosis, uh, separate out pieces of that. And for example, CTLA-4 uh, deficiency um, has lung disease that looks very similar to what I showed you uh, in terms of GLIL, the increase in lymphocyte proliferation and the granulomas can be seen occasionally in the lung with that condition as well. So it really depends on the whole context of the clinical disease and not uh, just the specific uh, lymphocyte markers. Great question. Is atelectasis like bronchiectasis? I have continued shortness of breath. It showed up on a CT scan for calcium score. Should I be getting an additional scan? If so, which one? Are there any treatments for this? I have PI, so have frequent lung infections and a few pneumonias. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, CT scans that are done for calcium scores, it depends um, on uh, how it's windowed and how it's read. Sometimes they uh, create a narrow window around the heart uh, and may not show the entirety of the lungs, and sometimes the lungs are shown on there as well. Um, atelectasis is different from bronchiectasis. It's a um, compression of the lungs, uh, and it may be seen in sort of dependent areas of the lungs on a CT scan where you're lying flat, it would be sort of in the back part uh, of your chest that it may be seen. Um, treatments for that are generally things that would help to expand the lungs. Um, and so using a device called an incentive spirometer, uh, which if you have, have had surgery done frequently, they'll ask you to use that post-operatively. And it's a device where you inhale and try to keep a little um, indicator up as high as you can for as long as you can. Uh, it, it helps to expand the lungs and it can help with that as well. Um, sometimes that can help with shortness of breath. Um, sometimes being a bit overweight uh, can result in atelectasis in the lungs as well. Um, and things like aerobic exercise, which will allow you to expand the chest wall better, uh, can help with that. Um, so th this is generally unrelated to uh, lung infections uh, unless that atelectasis is seen in an area of pneumonia. But I think those types of things would show up just as well on a CT done for calcium score as it would on a conventional CT. So I don't think there's, it's necessary to have a, a repeat scan. Can you share more information about the shaking or vibrating devices mentioned as treatment options for bronchiectasis. Is there a name or brand of device you recommend or use with your patients? Are these used daily as a preventative measure, even when active lung issues are not present, but one has the diagnosis? Um, yeah, those are great questions. The the, I showed um, a couple of examples. One was a percussive vest, uh, and there are multiple different vendors of those. There's one, that, one that's called the vest. Um, there is a, um, a system called the Monarch system, which is, I think, a battery-operated uh, vest that allows a little more mobility when it's on. Um, there are also other devices. Um, there's a device called Vibralung. Um, which uses sound waves to help expand uh, the lung and create those vibrations. And some of those devices will both deliver nebulized um, uh, drugs like albuterol or hypertonic saline, uh, in addition to sort of putting short bursts of positive pressure uh, in the lung. So I think if you go online and uh, Google percussive vest, for example, uh, you'll bring up several different vendors. The key thing with those devices is most of them will allow you a period, a trial period uh, to use them. Many people, for example, feel that the, um, 
uh, percussive vests are uncomfortable. They're, uh, they may feel constricting uh, to the chest when you have it on. So I think it's important uh, to talk to your doctor if you're interested in trying one of those uh, to make sure that uh, the one that's selected has a trial period uh, that you uh, can use. You do need a, do need a doctor's prescription uh, to use these. So I would recommend that you consult with your physician. They are generally used daily uh, as preventive measures in patients that have uh, bronchiectasis to uh, aid in, air, in the airway clearance. Um, and um, uh, with regard to um, they use a preventive measure even when an active lung issue is not present. Yeah, they're used more preventive rather than during acute treatments, but we also use them during uh, acute exacerbations or flares of bronchiectasis uh, to aid in clearance as well. So again, a key thing, there's a lot of different devices out there. You can generally follow, find these easily on the web, uh, consult with your physician uh, about using them, uh, and uh, strongly recommend a trial period before you uh, commit to buying it or, or renting them. They tend to be very expensive. Is immune globulin important for bronchiectasis patients because it helps keep them from getting illnesses with respiratory symptoms, which would do further damage? Yeah, so the evidence for use of immune globulin is a bit controversial. Certainly, uh, there's evidence that shows that it uh, can de decrease some of the airway infections. The upper airway infections uh, may be less. Um, and it probably helps some with the lower airway infections as well, um, but frequently it's not enough. Um, and there can be flares uh, in, in addition to using immune globulin. Um, but uh, any of these types of treatments that are designed to uh, decrease the frequency of infections or decrease the frequency of flares uh, can be helpful in uh, reducing overall inflammation in the lung uh, and preser preserving lung function and preventing further damage. What is the life expectancy of a person diagnosed with CVID and bronchiectasis? Uh, that is a great question. I'm not sure I can answer that. I think it's quite variable uh, and it, it may depend from person to person. Uh, we see a lot of um, CVID patients with bronchiectasis and uh, many of them, um, you know, have their disease under fairly good control. There's uh, relatively infrequent flares of it. Um, they are on, on good uh, airway clearance regimens. They adhere to uh, vaccine, actually vac not vaccine necessarily in this, but uh, they may be on immune globulin uh, replacement along with that um, and, you know, live normal lifespans. Um, other patients may get, you know, very significant infections or frequent recurring infections uh, which can lead to earlier onset in lung damage and, and progressive lung disease. Um, so I'm sorry I can't give you a more definitive answer, but it, it can vary quite a bit. Are there conditions where bronchiectasis will improve over time? Um, there, there can be. So bronchiectasis, the, the conventional uh, definition is a permanent uh, dilation of the airways. Um, though, you know, frequently um, or occasionally in children, uh, when it is initially seen, um, it, there can be treatment instituted, as I described in the talk, um, where there is improvement shown in this over time, where the bronchiectasis as the other airways grow may become less significant. Uh, the other areas that we have seen bronchiectasis improve over time is in the setting of cystic fibrosis, um, where there are now very specific drugs uh, that target the defect in cystic fibrosis um, that, that result in significant reductions in inflammation uh, around the airways. And while the dilated airways may still be there, the inflammation of the airway wall is no longer present. Uh, and those patients generally have uh, much milder courses uh, with these newer drugs with less frequent symptoms um, and uh, less uh, significant uh, progression of clinical symptoms. What is your opinion of the new drug, Dupixient, for bronchiectasis? Uh, 
Yeah, I don't know that there's a whole lot of data uh, on that. Um, so um, dupilumab or, or dupixent uh, can be useful in conditions like eczema, um, and um, there has been some um, discussion about you know use of it in, in, in certain types of asthma as well. I'm not aware of use of it for bronchiectasis in general outside of some case reports with a very specific cause of bronchiectasis um, it, that results from an allergy to mold. It's a condition called allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. And certainly this is not the conventional treatment for that condition, um, but in some patients who haven't responded to the conventional treatment, uh, which is usually a combination of steroids and antifungal agents, or they have difficulties with those uh, medications, other drug options have been tried, and there are some reports of use of a depixent uh, in that particular condition. Does the use of oxygen while sleeping help patients with bronchiectasis? Um, not necessarily. Um, in patients that require supplemental oxygen, the primary purpose of using that is actually to protect the heart. Um, in lung conditions where oxygen levels drop down low, uh, and on the oxygen saturation test, that's an oxygen saturation below 89%, uh, and that stays down chronically low over time, uh, that's been shown to be associated with um, enlargement of the right side of the heart uh, and right heart failure. The right side of the heart is responsible for pumping blood through the lungs. Uh, and with diffuse lung disease associated with lower oxygen levels, the body reads that uh, low oxygen level as a signal to clamp down on the blood vessels in the lung. Uh, and when that happens diffusely throughout the lungs, a condition called pulmonary hypertension can occur. And it makes it more difficult for the heart to pump blood uh, through the lungs. Uh, and so in patients whose oxygen levels are chronically low, or may drop down during exercise or sleep, um, the recommendations for, for oxygen are uh, primarily aimed at preventing uh, heart failure. Um, in some patients, they may also uh, improve symptoms, but there's not a great correlation between use of supplemental oxygen uh, or uh, reductions in oxygen levels and the symptoms that are associated with that. Some patients have very low oxygen, have very little symptoms, some patients are very short of breath and have very normal oxygen levels. I have both bronchiectasis and GLD. I get a spirometry once a year. How often should the other PFTs be done? Uh, it, it really depends. At our institution, uh, we generally get um, lung volumes and diffusing capacity uh, along with the spirometry. Um, and again, a GLIL tends to be more of a restrictive lung disease than uh, an obstructive lung disease. And those other tests can be a bit more sensitive uh, than the spirometry alone uh, if you're seen at a center that has the capability of doing those. Um, so the spirometry will give you some information. Those additional tests uh, can be helpful in providing additional information about possible progression of this. I have both bronchiectasis and glial. I get a, oh, excuse me. How common is bronchiectasis in someone diagnosed with a specific antibody disorder? Um, it, again, it can vary. Um, you know, bronchiectasis is seen fairly commonly in patients with common variable immune deficiency. Uh, and some of the other specific antibody deficiencies um, can be associated with a bronchiectasis. Some of them may not. It really depends on um, the significance of that and how well um, um, ability to fight off infections in those antibody disorders are. But it's clear that bronchiectasis can be seen in other uh, named antibody deficiencies other than um, the common variable immune deficiency. Is small amounts of green mucus a symptom of bronchiectasis when it happens sporadically? 
Yeah, it really depends. Great question. It depends on your definition of sporadically. Um, so, you know, acute bronchitis is a very common condition in the U.S. Um, and your airways may be inflamed with viral infections like the common cold. Uh, you know, having that occur during the winter season, um, you know, once a year um, is probably uh, not unusual. If you're having multiple flares of that uh, and uh, regularly producing um, green or yellow, what we call purulent sputum, uh, it's probably worth getting an evaluation to see if there's bronchiectasis there. So it's really um, a matter of the frequency and severity uh, of the symptoms uh, and the amount of sputum uh, that, that you're producing. Is bronchiectasis typically the result of infections? Can bronchiectasis be a breeding ground for infection? Yeah, that's a, those are great questions. So bronchiectasis um, is certainly worsened uh, by infections. The infections are associated with inflammation and some of the white blood cells and the things that they released that are called in during infection um, can actually help break down the airway wall that leads to uh, bronchiectasis and, and, uh, uh, and progression of the bronchiectasis. Um, it can be a breeding ground for infection, as I described during the talk. This inadequate clearance of mucus from the lungs allows those infectious uh, particles to uh, adhere to the airway wall and allow for greater uh, infection to occur. Um, and so uh, trying to manage those infections uh, with uh, early use of antibiotics uh, when the signs and symptoms of a flare occurs uh, or trying to suppress um, the chronic infection if there are multiple flares occurring uh, during the course of a year, coupled with the airway clearance measures that I said uh, described, um, it can certainly help to cut down uh, on the airway uh, wall damage. I'm an adult with bronchiectasis, also have C. F T R R D and memory specific antibody deficiency, all diagnosed in 2007. I could not tolerate azithromycin, so my only option was hypertonic saline um, and arabica and regular IV antibiotics to treat whatever strange bacterial infection I contracted. We started treating my PI with subcutaneous immunoglobulin along with budesonide as needed, and it's decreased my hospitalization significantly. But that keeps me on IG therapy. Is there any new treatment for bronchiectasis that doesn't require azithromycin? Um, that, that's a good question. Um, you you asked uh, or brought up several points in there, um, and you mentioned um, CFTR related disease. Um, the the frequency of having a single uh, mutation or a single what we call an allele inherited from your mother or father uh, in the setting of bronchiectasis is fairly common, um, and so the CFTR related disease. Um, the bronchiectasis can be a manifestation of that. It just means having that mutation associated with things that you typically would see in CF. Uh, as you mentioned, antibody deficiency is also seen with uh, bronchiectasis. So whether that um, uh, definition applies or not uh, is hard to say. Um, with regard to the antibody deficiency, I'm not aware of things other than immune globulin uh, replacement that'll uh, affect that directly. Um, and you asked about azithromycin. Azithromycin is generally uh, utilized in bronchiectasis in patients that are uh, having frequent flares. There have now have been three uh, large, well-done studies that have shown that uh, use of drugs like azithromycin or clarithromycin can decrease the frequency of those flares over time uh, in patients with pseudomonas. Um, there are other things that can be used, though. There are suppressive antibiotics like inhaled tobramycin that can be helpful. Uh, 
um, or inhaled as trianam. Uh, and then the airway clearance measures that I discuss can also be helpful in keeping the frequency of those flares under control. I was using repeated rituximab as needed for GLILT when my doctor supplemented it with mycophenolate. My PFTs approved. How will I or will I ever need rituximab again? Um, that's a great question, and it depends on several things. Um, one, rituximab reduces uh, the number of B cells, uh, and so one of the things that your doctor likely does is follow the number of B cells that you have um, and um, uses that as a, a measure, one of the measures to gauge when to redose it. Uh, the other thing is the control of your lung disease. Uh, if uh, you're being controlled with mycophenolate alone and don't have any uh, signs of progression, the redosing of rituximab uh, may not need it or it can be extended in terms of uh, when it may need uh, to be dosed again. Can individuals with CVID have both gliled and bronchiectasis? Yes, that certainly can occur. And I think uh, one of the previous questions uh, was from someone who did have both. I have CVID and chronic lung disease. What's the first symptom of GLILD? Uh, as I mentioned in the talk, um, some patients can be asymptomatic from it. Um, as it progresses, um, it generally is associated with shortness of breath, um, and, but since it can occur uh, without symptoms, uh, it's frequently recommended to screen uh, patients periodically um, to look for the, the types of changes that can be seen with GLILD. What, what kind of frequency of GLILD flare-ups and retreatments with rituximab or mycophenolate do you see in your patients? It varies uh, quite a bit. Some patients uh, get treated with that. It resolves and doesn't come back. Uh, other patients don't respond well to that treatment and require other treatments. And some people uh, may require periodic uh, retreatment uh, with rituximab as one of the uh, previous uh, questions uh, asked. Um, so it, uh, unfortunately, it's variable, and the approach to treating it, as I mentioned in the talk, can vary quite a bit from center to center. Um, there are now a lot of other drugs than the ones that I mentioned uh, that could be considered. It's just there's not a whole lot of experience or uh, publications uh, to go by uh, in, in knowing exactly uh, what the mix of those alternate drugs should be. I was diagnosed with bronchiectasis since age 17. Some chest um, scans do not see it, and some do. Even in the past year, currently 46 years old, um, this has occurred. I also have severe steroid-dependent asthma. So the question is, can lung obstruction, constriction from asthma, alter the CT results of bronchiectasis? Uh, yeah, there there may be several possible explanations for that. One, um, it can depend how the CT scan is done um, with regard to the sensitivity of seeing bronchiectasis there. Uh, people talk about getting a high-resolution CT scan. Now at most centers, most CT scans are high-resolution, and it refers to sort of the thickness of the slice and how close together those slices are uh, on the scanner. So if there's variation uh, in terms of how the scan is done from site to site or from time to time, uh, it may be a technical aspect of picking up bronchiectasis uh, or not uh, based on how the scan was done. Um, if the bronchiectasis is very mild, uh, there may be variation between radiologists uh, in terms of whether they will recognize or read it on the scan or not, that might account for it. Um, with severe asthmatic um, flares, there tends to be a condition called air trapping in the chest uh, where people can't maximally exhale uh, 
because of the airway obstruction. Uh, and that may change the appearance in certain areas of the lung that may make bronchiectasis more difficult to see. So um, the answer to your question is yes, I think that can affect it depending on whether your asthma control is optimized uh, or at baseline or uh, you're coming in with a flare of your asthma. Well, we have come to the end of this session and we still have lots of questions left. So if your question wasn't answered, feel free to send them to Ask IDF or please ask your, your own personal doctors for information. And very often IDF will create a blog or a newsletter article based on those questions that weren't answered. So watch for that also. Um, at this time, thank you, Dr. Olivier. Wonderful, wonderful presentation. It's been an honor to have you with us today and have you answer so many of these, these great questions. And thank you, everybody who attended this session. Enjoy the remaining um, part of the conference. Have a great day. It was my pleasure. Thank you for participating.